Yo. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace Christian Family Center. Thank you for being here. Nice crowd here today. Thank you for joining us by live streaming. And it's just a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord and praise the Lord. What's going on here at church this week? Remember uh, January 26th, the Wednesday night Bible study? We have on the screen, it's in person in the fellowship hall. We've done that the last two weeks. If you've tried to join us by live streaming, you've noticed we were not. And a lot of that reason is because I had some topics I wanted to cover that I just didn't want to put on live streaming because some of you folks out there are just plain nuts. And so I didn't want to put anything out there you'd go nutty over. And uh, so if you want to come Wednesday night, you can come Wednesday night. If you want to join in by live streaming, we might be live streaming this Wednesday night. No promises, no guarantees. Anytime we do a University of Grace lesson, it will be live streaming, and we'll announce those and put those out starting in February so that you'll know what's coming. And then, of course, next Sunday, remember, 9.30 Sunday School for all our kiddos and 10.30 uh, church and service in here. We mentioned a few names just a little while ago. Uh, and so we won't do those by live streaming, but you folks here know uh, kind of who we're talking about and who is in need today. So we're just going to ask you here and you watching by at home, join us in prayer today as we begin our service. Father, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for all the good things you have done. I thank you that some folks have just told me in the middle of their own battle with sicknesses over the last few months, that they've just reflected on the goodness of God and the glory of God and somehow you were still right there with them, leading them through uh, some of the dark days of sickness. We pray that for everybody watching today at home because they're sick. <laughs> we're just asking you to put your hand on them and bless their families and let them know and feel the wonder and the protection of God. Just heal us, God. Get us past this as a nation. Get us past this as a world. And bless us past this as a church. That's our prayer today in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. 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 God bless you. <clears throat> a film projector is a storyteller. It does this by taking a film reel that consists of thousands of images. Light is then passed through each frame, projecting an image onto a canvas. These images in sequence can tell us a powerful story of happiness, sadness, or even humor. Our lives in many ways are like a film projector. Every action we take and word we speak builds the narrative of a story God is wanting to tell through I'm us. I'm hand you this. Even though we all have different backgrounds, we have a choice of what we will project when the light of God shines through us. So what would someone see if they watched the movie of your life? Would they see light or darkness? Would they see life or death? Would they see love would they see grace? Would they see faith? Would they see Jesus? Good morning. Today, when you came in the foyer, if you walked right by the donation station, Don't pass it by on the way out. 
thank you for your donation. We don't pass an offering plate because we didn't want people to be paranoid about somebody walking by you and breathing down your neck or everybody congregating around a plate. So we just started doing it in the foyer. God bless you. It has worked. And so thank you for remembering to just stop at the donation station and put an offering in if you've got one to give. Or you can jump online. You can do it online at gracesoftheplace.com forward slash donate. And you can always mail checks in uh, the slow way uh, uh, to the mail. We don't care how they get here. Just get them here. That's all we really, that's all we really care about. Today going to be an old song day. You ready for this? I did not want to impose at the last minute on Tara and Scott. Thought about it. I thought about calling you Saturday morning and saying, hey, you had a little more notice last time, a little less notice today, but I, I know that's rough to do. And so here we are. We're just going to sing some old songs. You ready? I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk, dear Lord, close to Thee. Sing the chorus. Just a closer walk with Thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. You're not singing. Daily walking close to Thee. Let it be, dear Lord. Let it be through this world, toils and snares. Oh, if I falter, Lord, who cares? Who Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Yeah. Let it be, dear Lord. Let it be when my feeble life is o'er, and time for me will be no more. Guide me gently, safely. kingdom, dear Lord, to thy shore, just a closer walk with thee, granted Jesus is my plea, daily walking close I don't mean to be insulting to you, but the nursing home, when I sing it for them, they do much better singing along. I'm not trying to insult you, but at least at the nursing home, they sing along. These next two songs we're going to do both have the hand, the, the, the phrase, uh, take my hand, precious Lord, and, and uh, there's a hand I can see leading me. 
And I had an occasion a couple of weeks ago to reminisce about my dad and my father's hands <coughs> and uh, the strength that I felt in them. And uh, one of my little grandsons has a, 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 a unique and cute personality. And once in a while in a parking lot, he likes to ride with me. But he doesn't necessarily like to, you know, I don't know, he's got his own little brain working. And, and we'll be in the parking lot, and there'll be cars coming. And I'll say, come on, take my hand, buddy, and let's, let's go. Let's watch for cars. And if he's in the right mood, it's like, and I don't care. You know, grandpas don't. I just say, OK, well, just don't let a car hit you. Be on your own. <laughs> and I'll walk like this, and, the, and I don't look back. And just a couple of steps into it, I feel him grabbing one of my fingers back there. And his hand's too small to hold mine, so I just press my thumb in the back of his little hand as he's squeezing the finger. And it was just wonderful. We just walked together across the street, and everything's fine, and we've forgotten that little moment. And, uh, and then he said something about the knuckles on my finger uh, and the knots and the lumps and something, like he does sometimes. He's asked me a lot of questions that I find really intriguing. What color are your teeth, Grandpa? Well, mine are kind of green, yellow. <laughs> Why aren't they white like everybody else is? I don't know, son. I didn't get good stuff, you know. It's not uh, in my genes and whatever. And why are your fingers bent? I don't know. You know, don't worry about it. But it still gives him the comfort and the safety when we're crossing that street to grab. And my dad worked with his hands all his life. A hard-working man. Uh, never had a sit-down job or a desk job. Always working, hauling dry cardboard boxes, putting out oil machinery for Dearborn Stove Company, uh, filling up the assembly line with all the products it needed to be. Come home at the end of the day with dirty hands and black under his fingernails, and then he still went to work. There was no idle time. Don't remember my dad ever taking idle time. He didn't sit in chairs and listen to radio or watch TV. He just worked. Come home, work on the grounds. Uh, house, repair mowers, repair cars. He'd work on other people's cars. Uh, they'd pay him a little bit to fix something. He could fix anything. He could fix plumbing. And so he was always working. But I'm telling you, dinner was always around 7, 7.30 for us at the house uh, growing up as a boy. And about the time he knew it was time mom would have dinner on the table, he would come in and take a bath and clean up. And, he, and I have never seen my father's hands dirty at dinner time or nighttime. When he got through working, he scrubbed them. Anybody remember lava soap? Yeah. It, uh, men, you ladies ever use it? Yeah, one or two of you dirty ladies. <laughs> I don't even know if you can still buy lava soap. My dad lived, you can? Yeah. My dad lived for lava soap. It's got, uh, apparently it's got volcanic granules in it. I don't know. It feels like soap with sand in it. Pumice. And pumice. And he would, uh, that's a fancy word or sand, and he would uh, scrub, uh, he had a brush, a bristle brush, and he would dig the bristle brush in the bar of soap and then get it on those fingers, and his fingernails and his hands were spotless clean when he sat down at that table. My father's hands were always, I don't know why, and nobody told him to, my mom didn't, he just was a working man with dirty hands, and, but when it was dinner time, those hands were spotless. And, uh, and I remember exactly like one of my grandsons, I remember looking a few times at my dad's hands when I got a little older in junior high school and he had spots on them and I wondered what those were and his knuckles were bent and broken like some of mine and it was an old hand. But I also remember very fondly a few times when I was little and my dad and I would be, he liked to go to places my mom didn't like to go, Canton's first Monday. Y'all don't know this, but back in the early days, they just blocked off Main Street at both ends, and people set their trade wares up on Main Street. I don't think it was called Main Street, but it was one of the main roads by the square. And my dad would take me down there. Mom didn't care for it. He would trade lawn mowers for pocket knives, case knives and barlow knives. But he was always in a hurry because we had to get back. And so when he was in a hurry, he would just say, come on, son, let's just get through this crowd. Get my hand. And I'd grab my dad's hand, and even when I was in the sixth grade and so his hand was so fat and big he was a big stocky man not tall just stocky and his hand was so big I couldn't grab his whole hand I just grab a couple of fingers and that was enough and I'd run with him and I don't know how much that plays on you know your memories of your dad or your mom's hands or whatever they are and my pastor sang the second song we're going to do today when I was growing up. There's a hand I can see leading me. And I've often wondered if 
these songs and just my father's habit with his hands always being clean. When my father, when we got through with dinner and I was learning to read in about the second grade, we'd go sit on the couch. My dad would just come here and read this Bible and he'd pick the big old family Bible up and lay it on our laps, my little one in his big lap. And then he would just point at a chapter heading. He couldn't read, but I didn't know that. He said, why don't you start reading right here? And if it was an Old Testament chapter that didn't make a lot of sense to him, he would just say, yeah, you're doing good. Let's flip over. And he'd just flip over and find something else. Start reading right here. And then I'd start reading. And I would just read. And he said, put your finger on it. I had to put my finger on it and trace it. My teacher said, don't trace them. Well, that's all right. That's at school. Here, you trace it. Because he wanted to see the words as I was reading them. That's just the way he, that was his way of getting to read the Bible. And, and I don't remember much about him other than the smell of clean khakis and how pristine clean his hands always were. I'd see them black outside in the garage and out working. And then it's time after dinner to sit down and read a few verses. And he'd point with his finger, <coughs> his crooked finger. He'd point with his finger and say, start reading right here. And I would just start reading. And his clean hands and the smell of khaki and brilliantine in his hair. Anybody know what that is? Only old people would know what brigantine is. And those smells, I remember the smell of khaki and the smell of brigantine. I'm going to preach to you today hoping you smell good. But in the meantime, join with us and let's sing these songs. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak. I am warm through the storm, through the night. Lead me on to the night. Take my hand, precious Lord. Lead me home when my way grows drear, precious Lord linger near when my light is almost done hear my cry hear my call hold my hand lest I fall take my hand precious Lord lead me home when the darkness appears and the night draws near and the day is past and gone at the river i stand guide my feet hold my hand take my hand Precious Lord, lead me home. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, Lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord. Lead me home. Amen. Amen. When I stand up for the right in the hardest of the fight, there's a hand I can see leading me When I call both night and day Lord give me strength to always say There's a hand, a guiding hand leading me Well there's a hand I can see leading me on the glory every step of the way leading me 
Now when I do the best I can With a broken heart and these trembling hands There's a hand I can see leading me When I stand on Jordan's shore I'm going home to fight no more There's a hand I can see leading me Oh, when the water opened wide And I stand and look at the other side Lord, let your hand, your guiding hand Keep on leading me There's a hand I can see Leading me on to glory Every step of the way Leading me Now when I do the best I can With a broken heart And these trembling hands, there's a hand, a guiding hand, leading me. It's a good, amen. Thank you, ladies. It's a good thing that's the last one, because I don't think I got a voice left, and uh, and I think you're getting tired. I wish I had Mason here with her mandolin. We'd have made it a little more, we'd have made it a little bluegrass. I want you to smell good today. Uh, don't, don't embarrass anybody, but hopefully everybody around you smells good. I made sure today to put on a little cologne. I never wear it anymore. And I thought if I preach about smelling good, sure as the world, somebody's going to walk by me and see if they smell B.O. So if you walk by me, you're going to smell Aqua de Gio. I know it's old, it's been around for a hundred years, but it was my favorite when I used to wear a little clone just to try to smell better or to accommodate for no shower, which doesn't work by the way, just in case you wonder. But uh, I, I do want to, uh, I want to uh, amuse you for a moment and then I hope I wanna bless you for just a little bit with the word today something we don't often think of is just the odors around us. I want to go to a verse and pick my topic carefully today. This is the New American Standard Bible, 2 Corinthians, 2 chapter, verse 14. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma. And manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him, the knowledge of Christ in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, we're an aroma from death to death. To the other, we're an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? We're not like many who are peddling the word of God, trying to profit from it. But we speak as from sincerity as from God. We speak in Christ, in the sight of God. I love those phrases in there. Look at them again while that's on the screen. Thanks be unto God who always leads us in victory in triumph. We eventually we triumph. We don't always triumph immediately, but you live long enough, you realize I have triumphed over every bad thing that's ever happened. Somehow bad stuff happened, and I didn't even know if I was going to see the day, and, and, and I've triumphed. And some people triumph complaining and bitter and mad, and some triumph like a sweet aroma. You, you, you got the gist of it? You to, they're like a sweet aroma. I love this phrase right here. And he manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Christ everywhere we go. Wherever we are, we should smell good. We should smell like the aroma of Christ. If you're in a sick room with somebody, don't tell them that you knew three people died just like they are. That's not a sweet aroma. 
You know, you probably better go to the emergency room. My, uh, I, my friend was doing just, coughing just like you, and they died. That stinks. I don't mind telling you, whoever you are needing to hear this, that is not a good smell. That stinks. I want to be uplifted by you. I want your aroma to be pleasant. I want you to smell like aqua de Gio. I actually was trying to buy some one time, and the store was out of it. I've forgotten. Macy's or somewhere, and I said, man, do y'all not carry it? Oh, we do. We just don't have a big demand for it. I said, what? It's the best smell ever. She said, the lady selling said, it's a little too citrus for me. I like a floral base. Well, go analyzing it, why don't you? It just smells good. I don't need a chemist. I need it to make my nostrils feel. Oh, that's a good smell. We are like the sweet aroma of Christ in every place we go. If you're in a hospital room, you ought to bring a good aroma in. If you're, if you're uh, on, by a deathbed, you ought to bring a sweet aroma. If you're just talking to some friends on a hunting trip, you, you ought to be that pleasant aroma. You, if you're on a business call, you should be ple- For we are a fragrance of Christ to everybody. We're a fragrance to those who are being saved and to those who are perishing. Not one kind of person to my friends and a different kind to, not one kind to my saved people, but a bad one. I'm going to be different to you because, well, you're bad. That's not not a pleasant aroma. I love these phrases. So I'm just going to ask you for a minute. Do do, do you remember, what smells do you remember? Anything stick in your mind? Don't ask. Don't call it out loud because it might be bad. But you and I know that there are, that smells affect us. I have a dog that's so funny. She's a little shih tzu. She's 14 years old. She has been uh, totally blind now for probably two years ago. She might could see light and dark. <clears throat> but after our last visit a couple of weeks ago to the vet, the vet said uh, she's in total darkness. She can see nothing. I said, well, I know that. I carry her out to the grass. I only have a spot of grass about 15 feet wide. Everything else is gravel and stone. I, I don't like to mow. So I carry her out to the grass area, and she finds her favorite bathroom out there. It takes her a while. You would think in 15 foot of grass that you could just poop, but no. She has to smell it until she finds Bucky's. And when she finally finds Bucky's, you married to a woman like that, you know, you know, you can pass up 500 restrooms, but you got to get to Bucky's because they have clean ones. Don't act like you haven't heard that in your car driving. My dog has got to have Bucky's. And if it's a cold, drizzling morning, oh my word, thank goodness I have a gazebo out there and awning. I just go shiver under it and she can't hear. Did I mention that? She's totally deaf. She's lost all hearing, uh, literally all, can't hear anything, and all of her sight is gone. So I can't just say, hurry! It, it doesn't compute. She doesn't hear it. So I have to wait till she's through with Bucky's, and then I go pick her up, bring her back in, put her down. And she's so excited and animated, and she can sniff her little trail over to where the bacon falls. And then she gets the bacon, and she's happy, and she can sniff her trail back to her bed. There is one thing we've noticed. No matter what groceries we bring in the house, nothing really gets her attention except chicken. She can smell any version of chicken any time we bring it in the house. Anything. If I, now, when I say chicken, normally it means the pre-cooked chicken you buy in the little crate. That's the way I cook chicken. And I, I bring one of those in at least once a week. Uh, the other day, a few days ago, I just got in the mood for chicken salad. I, I just wanted to make chicken salad. So I stopped at the grocery store on the way home and I bought celery and I had dill pickles already and I bought uh, green onions and I bought uh, chicken and I knew I had mayo and Dijon and you know the stuff. Uh, So I went home and went in the kitchen with chicken in the sack and in a tub. I did buy the pre-cooked chicken so I could just chop up the breast and make my, I'm I'm, I'm not a cook. I'm a preparer of already cooked stuff. And so uh, it's in the, 
kitchen in a bag. They knotted the bag. It's in a container. And I'm leaving it over there on the counter. I'm getting the celery and stuff out where I want it and getting ready to chop up and stuff. And I feel a bump on my leg. I look down, and that stinking dog is just excited. She's just wiggling, and she's bumping. She had found my leg smelling. Now she's bumping my leg, bump, bump, bump. Now her bed's way in yonder in the living room, but she smelled chicken when I came in from the garage, and she is bumping my leg with her blind nose. Wants chicken, and of course you know I give her chicken. The next day, there was just enough chicken salad left over my wife uh, for one sandwich. So you know who got it the next day. And uh, you want it? Oh no, I'll just eat soup or something. So she got the chicken salad for the, the next midday treat. Now chicken salad been in the refrigerator. It's, 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 the, the smell of chicken is all hidden by mayonnaise and Dijon and you know celery and all that stuff in there. But as soon as she sat down in the recliner to just munch on chicken salad, the dog goes nuts. She nudged me and said, look at the dog. And she has jumped up in her bed, looking around, looking around. She can't see. She's looking around. And her tongue, I won't emulate her tongue. Her tongue is just flapping top and bottom. Like a snake. She is literally smelling with her tongue. She knows there's chicken somewhere in the room. And she was not happy until she got over there close enough to the smell. Now, beef, I can cook meat. She doesn't smell it. It doesn't matter to her. But the smell of chicken is her favorite smell in the world. And you know that that's the way that this works. There's a reason the scripture gives us the language it gives us from time to time. So I'm not just trying to be silly about this. Here the Bible has taken a time to include in a verse that there ought to be something about you and me and our Christian walk with God that's like a good smell that makes people want whatever you're eating. So that's where we're kind of going with this today. You, you, you got any bad smells? Did you know there are some things that you probably won't eat just because of how it smells? I've been given some food choices before. I don't care how much you like it. It will never enter my palate because it enters my nose first. When I was in Vietnam, uh, the uh, Mama Sons uh, that worked you know, on base camps occasionally for us, uh, they would always bring their favorite, their favorite Vietnamese snack. It's called nook mom. And nook mom is made by when they cut fish, when they catch fish and they cut off the heads, which are worthless because they got no meat in them. All the heads of the fish go into a bucket. <clears throat> so they got a bucket filled up with the heads of fish, and then they cover them with salt. And the salt draws all of that green that stuff out it just becomes green it, it over a few days it ferments and it just pulls all that stuff out and then they use that for the base of making a dill that they love uh my uh, I, I got to know vietnamese people on two scales the uh, mountain yard people uh, uh were the first people i got to meet down in south vietnam uh Cuchy and and uh, the mountain yards uh, or not like, it's just like, that means mountain people. It, so it's kind of like, you know, from the deep woods of Tennessee or from New York City. So I got to work with uh, graduates from the University of Saigon uh, at one time for about uh, three months. And I got to work with mountain yards for about nine months. And uh, the difference in them is stunning. It's a stunning difference. The mountain yards love grasshoppers. And when it was time for them to have their lunch or snack, they would squat down with grasshoppers trapped between, live, trapped between their fingers. They'd break the legs and the wings off, and then they would dip them in nook mom and, and, uh, and crunch and eat it. And they love it. And so they offered me some nook mom one time, and I said, well, I might try it, because they loved it. I, they were so happy when it was break time they got to eat. And so I, I, I took a little bowl of it one time, thinking that I would eat it. But you know how you are? You, you like to smell something before you eat it? And that was a mistake, because when I put that up, I, oh my God, my eyes watered and they crossed. And I said, are y'all eating this? Oh, it's wonderful. No, 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 do, do, do this. Do. You just have to try it. Now, no, thank you. I have never to this day, will not to this day, eat Nook Mom. Now, I know there are probably different ways to make it and prepare it, but it doesn't matter to me. Same thing is true with Limburger cheese. Y'all like Limburger cheese? You're a knucklehead if you do. I don't care. That stuff is raunchy. It smells so bad. 
there are some things that just the smell alone will block me out. And so I know when the scripture talks about aroma, there's a reason it's giving us this. We can be putrid and acrid and bitter and nobody want to be around us or we can be sweet and warm and I only threw floral in there because the lady at Macy's said, I prefer a floral base. Well, good for you. I like lemon and lime. And if that's what Aqua de Gio smells like to you, too bad. Which I still can't smell it in there, but she said it was. When I was, uh, my wife's probably not watching my live streaming, so I'm going to get by with this. If you are, go get something to drink in the kitchen. Uh, when I was uh, traveling around the country back from Vietnam, and uh, speaking on campuses and preaching in churches from California to Mississippi, just kind of accidentally. I didn't know what to do with my life and didn't know where I was going. And it's like the phone rang and one door opened and then another pastor called and then an, a group called. And I spent over a year and a half on the road traveling full time, speaking and preaching. And uh, that was the beginning of my ministry other than the Vietnam experience. And. Uh, and I met a girl in, in, in a, a, a church out of, you know, out of state. And uh, she was really, really sweet. And I really liked her. And I knew she liked me. And, uh, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, we said our goodbyes. And I moved on to another state, two or three states away. But I wasn't going there right away. I was about five days out from my uh, assignment there. And so finally, I'd go back to Dallas and I say hello to mom and dad and clean my clothes. And then I head out for uh, New Mexico, I think. I get to New Mexico. And I, I, didn't, I don't know this pastor. I don't know these people. I don't know his family. I drive up at their address. I'm there for a few days with them. I'm going to speak Wednesday through Sunday. And uh, so I drive up and uh, get acquainted. And uh, how are you doing? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, ma'am. Uh, timing is perfect. Dinner's about to come on the table. Oh, that's great. Wonderful. You're going to eat with us. Okay, good, good. And uh, I sit down, and he comes over, and he says, oh, by the way, this came for you. And it was a letter. And it was from the girl that I had met in another state just last week. And it smelled before he handed it to me. Did y'all ever like anybody enough to put perfume on a letter when you mailed it? Well, if you've never had that experience, I feel sorry for you. And uh, go back and get something else to drink. <laughs> and, uh, and man, the pastor, he is waving it like, he's grinning. This came for you. And as he does it, it just wafts. Still on there five days after she mailed it. Huh? Well, that's a little embarrassing. I'm here to preach a revival, tell everybody they're going to hell, get a lot of people in altars. And I got this, I can't wait to, I'm not going to read it in front of them. Open it up, Reverend. No, I'll just read it later. And so when I finally got to my room, I opened it up and it was sweet and it was sweet nothings and it was sweet. And I thought, that's really cool. She likes me. I associated floral scents with her. The only problem was the next day, I got another letter from her. And then the next day, another one. And then I went to Colorado. And when I arrived at Colorado and met a new pastor and his wife, and I'm there to preach for them, and they're going to take me down to the hotel I'm staying in. And he said, oh, by the way, these came for you. I had given her my itinerary. And I had letters waiting for me at each place. I don't mind telling you, I love the perfume. I love the language. I loved what they signified. But it was awkward for me trying to be a holy roller preacher and, uh, and getting perfumed at letters. I don't know if it ever offended any of those guys or not. They never said so if they did. But I really don't care because it's still a pleasant memory. Are you still in the kitchen? It's still a pleasant memory to have received letters that had that smell on them. Now, I don't know if anybody does that anymore. And please don't start doing it because you just heard me say it. All I'm telling you is, if you noticed a minute ago, a bad smell predisposes us to a dislike. If it doesn't smell right, I'm probably not going to like it, no matter what it is. I'm already predisposed to know it's going to taste horrible. 
even if it's not food. When I was in a seminary, a Bible college, my roommate, you just take the luck of the draw, and I was back from the Army and Vietnam, and I had spent a year and a half traveling across the country, almost two years. And uh, I get to my dorm, and my roommate is a young boy just graduated from high school. Really a nice kid. But he just graduated from high school. Now, the military gives you discipline, you know. You put your clothes in the right place. You hang them in the right place. Uh, you take them to the cleaner, and you get them cleaned right, and the collar's right. You know, I mean, that's just what it is, you know. My, that's the way I still am. My, I, all my clothes go to the cleaner because my wife can't iron them right and she's not going to. So all my clothes go to the cleaner and when they come back from the cleaner, they all hang in a designated spot. Suits are there, don't have many of those anymore. Long sleeve shirts are here and once in a while I just group them by blue. Blue takes this much space. And then I got two purples, this one and another one, they go right there. And then I got a couple of yellow ones and then I got a bunch of gray ones and they all kind of do that. And then down below in my golf shirts, I don't wear hardly anymore in golf shorts, but it's all, that's military. Here's a kid out of high school whose mama did everything for him. He doesn't have any manners. He throws his clothes on the floor in the living room. And the first evening that we're in that dorm together, he pulled off his shoes I don't know how any man in the world can have a foot odor like my roommate had. It was so bad, it literally filled that living room within 30 seconds. And I said, oh my God, what is that smell? He said, oh, I'm sorry, they tell me I have a bad foot odor. I said, they, you have to have somebody tell you that? You don't smell that yourself? From now on, take your shoes off in your bedroom, keep them on in here. We worked out a truce. He was a little afraid of me. And so we worked out a truce. He didn't pull them off when I was sitting in the living room. I, he literally had. Now, he turned out to be a nice guy. In fact, we married sisters and didn't even know we were both proposing to the sisters. So we wound up having a double wedding. He passed away a year or two ago from cancer. Great guy. And, uh, and so we wound up being brother-in-laws in time. But we didn't know that was going to happen then. I will tell you, he still never took his shoes off even after we were married brother-in-laws and they'd come to our house to play games. He did not take off his shoes. The stench was that bad. And the first night that I smelled it, it predisposed me to know, I'm not going to like this guy. I'm just not because he put a bad odor in my nostrils. And that's what the scripture is trying to tell you in maybe a humorous way. If you smell good, I'm predisposed to think I'm going to like whatever you are and whatever's coming. Now, you, you remember we're still talking about a scripture. It's not really about odors. It's about heart and love and kindness. Remember Maya Angelou, uh, one, of her, one of my favorite quotes from a woman who has... Google Maya Angelou quotes and you'll find a bunch of wonderful things she said. One of my favorite quotes, and I might not quote it exactly, but you've heard it and you'll know it. She said, people won't remember you for what you said. They'll remember you for how you made them feel. And that is a truth. I reflected the other day on a, a, a couple of men who were important in my life. Uh, a, a man uh, called me and we were talking about uh, someone he was trying to help and he said I don't know what to do and he was explaining a few problems that the other younger man had and I said man I, I don't know what to tell you but I will tell you what a couple of men did for me in my life and so I just shared again two wonderful men that I knew in school a principal and a teacher and I told him I said man let me tell you what the teacher did for me and I told him uh, an example that he said and something that he did one time that literally changed my whole attitude toward taking something that wasn't yours and toward him as a man of character. He took a bunch of us boys on a trip, a field trip. We were in drafting in school. My high school had a, an enormous uh, trades program. You went to whatever you chose to do, you would do it three hours a day, and I chose drafting engineering and so we got to uh, go three hours a day and work in drafting and it was wonderful because my high school had everything a real estate department my class literally drew the plans for a three-bedroom home 
and the real estate class bought a lot every year. The construction trade class built the house we designed and drew. Every year we built a house and the real estate group sold it, put it on the market, put the money back in the bank and bought another lot and we'd do that every year. Can you believe high schools ever did that? And my drafting teacher was a wonderful man named Fred Gregory. And he took a bunch of us, we won some prizes and we won some awards for drafting and design. So we had to go way up Sulphur Springs uh, to an event and just a handful of us, he had a station wagon and I think there were five of us that had won things and we all got to ride with him. And on the way back, we're having a good time. On the way back, we stop at a little mom and pop diner on the road so we can all have a, a hamburger and then we get back in the car, and you know, you gotta remember, we're juniors in high school, so it's kind of cool for us just to be away from everybody out on the road, you know, road trip. We get in the car, and we're driving, and I'm in the front seat with Mr. Gregory, because I was his pet, and I was the best one in the group, and so I always got to ride up front if I wanted to, and they started giggling in the back, I turned around to see what they were giggling about, and one of the boys pulled one of the salt shakers out of his shirt, it's just a little plastic salt shaker. You'd probably buy them for a dime. But he had taken it off the table in that little mom and pop restaurant. And they were giggling in the back because it was funny for some reason that he took that off. And my dad was a stickler about stealing things. And even though it was a dime salt shaker, it changed my smell for that boy. The aroma was putrid. I, I don't like people who steal anything, period. Don't steal. Don't take what someone else worked for. And it changed my attitude toward him. Mr. Gregory is watching in the mirror and laughing. What are y'all giggling about? What are y'all giggling about? What are y'all giggling about? And finally, you know, we put some miles between us and there. I guess they thought it's safe now. So one of them said, oh, Johnny took a salt shaker from that table. And Mr. Gregory, so calmly, he just smiling still. He eased over on the shoulder of the highway. Turned around and said, what'd you take? And he said, oh, I don't know why it's funny. Boy, giggling. Mr. Gregor said, you know, that's, that's stealing. That's not a nice thing to do. Oh, it's not expensive. Doesn't matter. You took something that wasn't yours, and they'll have to replace it. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to drive back. Now, remember, this, we didn't have cell phones in those days. So we can't call the school and tell them we're going to be late. We're already 10 miles down the road. Mr. Gregory drove down to a U-turn in the interstate. We drove all the way back up to the, the town, pulled back in. He said, you want me to go in with you? I will. No, no. He said, well, stand right there in that window so I can watch you hand it to her. The boy goes in. He hands her the salt shaker. He apologized. He comes back a little crestfallen. There's no more giggling in the back seat now. Mr. Gregory didn't try to insult him and hurt his feelings. As soon as we pulled back out on the road, Mr. Gregory is trying to sing old songs that none of us know. He's trying to lighten the mood. He's trying to liven everything up. And it takes a while. It's probably 10 or 15 miles before boys finally start talking again. But they do, before we ever get back to Mesquite, Texas, they start laughing again because he had no insults and no criticism. He just didn't want that to be an example on his watch. And when, before we got to the school, he pulled off a block away and pulled over on the curb and stopped and said, all right, boys, let's just talk about what happened. This is gonna stay between us if y'all want it to. That's where it's gonna stay with me. Just so you know, I believe it's wrong to take anything that belongs to anybody else. And just so you know, Johnny, that doesn't mean I think you're a bad person. I just think you did something you thought would be funny, and it, and it, and it wasn't to me. So from now on, on our trips, you know, you're going to win a lot more prizes. You're going to do great. On our trips, just remember, we don't take anything that's not ours from anywhere. Y'all got it? Yes, sir. Okay, let's go say hello to your parents. They're going to be mad we're late. And we go back. You think any of those boys would ever take anything again on a trip? Did they hate Mr. Gregory? Oh, no. He was everybody's favorite teacher in our group. Because even though he had to make a correction, he did it in such a good and kind and warm way that he still smelled good. He still left us with dignity and honor. He didn't shame us in front of anybody. 
He didn't do away with anything. He just like Maya Angelou quote, he just made us feel good even though we knew it was kind of cheap and tawdry what had been done. There was a woman who was a missionary for 44 years to, in India. Her husband was a missionary, but so was she. And she was quite a Sunday school proponent. Now this was in the 1800s, and you may not know church history enough to know that Sunday school only started in the 1800s. The churches never had Sunday school morning classes for kids. And like all things related to the church, anytime somebody tries a new idea, there's always somebody thinks it's wrong. And there was one man even walked by her. She started Sunday schools in India. They, they worked for 44 years in Ceylon, and then, uh, which is Sri Lanka, I think now, and then in India. And uh, uh, when she started, uh, decided that I want to get all the kids together, we're going to have a class, and we're going to make crafts, and we're going to talk about the Bible stories, uh, there were some people who thought you shouldn't do that. And she got use of a building, and can you believe the building owner, when he found out she was teaching children the Bible in Sunday school, well, there was two marks against her. One, Sunday school wasn't in the Bible, and she was a woman. And she didn't care. She kept teaching them. And he came in and shut down the building, said, you're not going to use this building. She found another building in town that would let her use it. And uh, she didn't exactly tell them what for. So she started classes again. And then the outcry came from some parents whose kids weren't coming and enjoying the class. And they made him shut her down. And so there still was a handful of kids that just wanted to go color pictures and make crafts and hear Bible stories. So she started meeting out in the park just open air, steps of a building out in the park. And a man, uh, an old pastor walked by there with an ornate cane and shook his cane at all of them. And, and, and one of her memories, you know, that she would write about, he said, of the devil, all of you are of the devil. Because she was daring to try to have a Sunday morning class with kids before their church time. Hard to believe, isn't it now? But that's the way it was in the 1800s. And so she just ignored him and told the kids ignore him, and they kept doing it. And she's responsible eventually for finally getting the churches in their whole reign in India to start allowing kids to come early and color pictures and learn about stories in the Bible. Great, great woman. And uh, didn't make any enemies except those who chose to make her an enemy. She just, uh, for lack of a better description, they say she just had a sweet, pleasant nature, a good aroma. And so the real thing about her, though, is not that. The real thing is she spent 44 years in Ceylon in India. She was the very first person in her family to become a Christian. And not long after that, her mom and dad followed her into her faith, and they became Christians and were baptized. Not long after that, her entire family started coming around because they were so taken by her and the change that had come to her. See, sometimes people start going to church or become Christian, and they become a little holier than everybody else. They become a little judgmental about what everybody else is doing. But not Harriet Winslow. Harriet Winslow just loved them more than she had loved them before. And if they liked her before, now they liked her even more because when she was able to get around the family, she always brought such a sweet aroma. They wanted to know what had made her so loving and kind. And so shortly after that, three of her sisters decided they wanted to be Christian. And not too long after they converted to Christianity, they wanted to be missionaries as well. And all three were appointed missionary assignments by denomination. One of her brothers wanted to be a pastor, but he died just before he could be confirmed. And another one went out west in America and founded churches in Western America in the frontier days in the 1800s. And her only daughter married a missionary. And she was overshadowed by a missionary named Judson and his wife. If you ever just look at who were the pioneers who went to India to take the gospel, you'll more likely see the name Judson than you will Winslow. But the Winslows were there for 44 years and the real aroma of her life to me is not Sunday schools in India but it was that her entire family wanted to become what she was. And not just Christian. They wanted to be missionaries reaching others just like she did. 
I thought yesterday, yesterday we had a memorial service up here uh, for uh, a man that m none of you probably know, uh, John Lewis Reyes, but some of you here did know his dad, uh, uh, John Robert Reyes. John Robert Reyes was uh, a teacher in our church for many years. He was a Hispanic pastor. To, he would interpret if we had somebody who didn't speak English, he would interpret for me. A lot of times in the old building, he would take them in my office because there was a window so that they could still see service and he could interpret for them uh, in that room and not be talking out loud where anybody could hear him in the auditorium. And uh, the other thing about John Reyes was that, you know, he, I, I don't remember where he grew up, third ward, fifth ward, huh? north side, uh, the gang infested area. Uh, I, I don't know uh, uh, any church member I've ever known in all the years I've pastored in three different churches. I have never, ever known anyone who was as determined to try to reach his family like John Reyes was. Over the years, I've baptized more people from John's family than I have from anybody else's family. I don't know that all of them were willing and compliant. There might have been some tied. We may have buried in water a few people who had protested, or maybe one or two had had to get a little bit drunk just to come in and let us do it. I'm not sure about that, but I will tell you that I baptized a lot of people in his family, including his beautifully white-haired dad and mom, the Sotos, baptized both his parents uh, in water because they both were converting to Christian faith. It's not that they hadn't believed in something and had some Catholic background, but they just didn't have anything. And John had grown up without any real connections to faith, and he wanted it. <clears throat> and. Uh, well, and it's just so many people in his family, so many stories you would not believe that made it critical that John was the kind of man he was. Nobody hated him. Everybody loved him. He didn't make anybody mad. He died way too early. In fact, he died in his home, sitting in his recliner, studying his Sunday morning lesson for the next day. I still have a copy of that lesson that he was studying that night, and I wrote on it John's last lesson and I've got it in my files, and uh, that's where it'll stay. Uh, once in a while I come across it, it reminds, I think he was only like 54 years old or something like that, he wasn't an old man. He died of a heart attack, studying his lesson. I wish he'd lived longer, because if he had, if I'd have baptized everybody in his family, I do believe. Baptized his sons, baptized his other relatives. And the good thing is, over the years, you know, like a lot of families, I, I get to do weddings and funerals. And this one, uh, the funerals were unbelievable. Uh, one of his, uh, I believe it was his brother that was supposed to meet uh, a daughter and uh, kind, of, kind of going to be reconciled for the first time. And uh, the, he was a truck driver, and they were going to meet at a gas station out off of I-10. And uh, he pulled up in there, and uh, she saw the truck, and she and her little grandson, she wanted to see her her daddy for the first time, opened the door of the station to go out and run to meet him. And just as he got out of his truck and uh, headed toward his daughter and his grandson for a first reunion and meeting, two carloads of, of gang members came flying through the gas station shooting at each other. And one of the stray bullets shot that man. And he died on the concrete in a gas station before he reached his daughter and his grandson. And, uh, and I don't mind telling you that there's no way to explain the heartbreak. Uh, it was such a privilege and an honor for me just to be able to, to do uh, funerals in that family because I knew that everybody had in some way been impacted by a man who left the best aroma every place he went. And nobody in his family would ever point at him and say, he treated me wrong after he became a Christian. He was a bad man. He was a hypocrite. He was nobody ever said that. <coughs> that John Ray. Wonderful. And so I'm, I'm just telling you today before you leave, and I know it's time to go. I'm just going to ask you, 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 do you know how to be a sweet fragrance? Do you know what you need to do to be that kind of person? And I know some of you already are. Uh, some of you stink a little bit. Not, not bad, but you do have a little bit of stink now and then. It just depends on what mood you're in. 
and we've all smelled it. And you smell mine a time or two? That's all right. I cover mine up with a little more cologne the next day after that bad day. And that's what's what we'll all do. But here's what the scripture says, and I'll leave you with this simple, simple verse. Be an imitator of God. Just, just try to copy what you think Christ would do. What do you think Christ would really do to people? Read the red letters in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Just read the red letters and see how Christ talked to people. Didn't matter what they were. Lepers, everybody else is wrong. Unclean, unclean. And Jesus just walk over and touch them. Lay hands on them. Be an imitator of God. As you know, you are his beloved children. So act like his child. Emulate him and walk in love. I underlined it. And walk in love. Just as Christ loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering, a sacrifice to God <laughs> as a fragrant. You ever smelled anything about Christ that smells bad? No. He's never hurt you. He's never shamed you. He's never insulted you. He's never mocked you. He's never pouted and turned away because you want to open your heart's door. I know I use this verse every month in a pulpit, but I just love. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens, I come into him and sup with him. We'll have something to drink together and visit for a while. There's no austere language about hellfire and brimstone. You've got to be saved. I knock. And then you just ask, how often does he knock? No, he never stops. He's knocking on your door today just in case you hadn't opened it. Just, just listen. That little tug you feel, I need to do better. That's him knocking. That's just what he does. He has never quit. He, he just keeps doing it. And one day you'll hear it and you'll say, I, just come in. And when he does, he, he'll just come in to enjoy. I will sup with you. You will sup with me. He's, I've known people that would shame you for anything you do. I've had people shame me a lot. When I was younger, I've had people shame me because I looked depressed. I was. I was broke. I didn't have any money. I wondered how I was going to put gas in my car just to get home from church. You know, you need to hold your head up, Daddy. People are watching you. Oh, okay. I'm still going to be broke. But Jesus never does that to us. He never does that. I've messed up so bad, he never shamed me. The prodigal son, I've been the prodigal son. Gone for a while with my lust and my indulgences and my greed. I finally come crawling back, and he just says, no, 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 no probation for you. Put my robe on, here's my ring, put it on. You got all your authority, you're back. We're going to celebrate. We're going to have a party. <laughs> no wonder he smells so good. And that's what he wants us to do. I miss something now and then. I, I just quit with this little reference. But you, heard, you hear me say now and then, the disciples said, Lord, how often shall we forgive somebody? If somebody offends us seven times in a day, how often shall we forgive him? And seven times? And Jesus said, no, seven times 70, 490 times. Now, you know he didn't mean multiply that. But if you read the right version, you notice in there that, you, that we ought to stress this more sometimes. They say, they don't say, how often shall I forgive my brother? Seven times? No, 490 times. They said, how often if my brother offends me in a day shall I forgive him? Seven times? And Jesus said, no, seven times 70. In a day! That doesn't mean in your lifetime you get 490 forgivenesses. For, for, have you ever had to ask God to forgive you 490 times in a day? Well, if you have, don't worry about it because he's still standing there ready to forgive sweet aroma of love. And you're his child. Be an imitator of him and just leave that sweet aroma in every place you go. Stand, please. Would you just ask the Lord to make that happen in your life? Father, we just thank you today for your blessing and thank you for the love and thank you for the kindness and thank you for the warmth. Thank you for being what you are to all of us. Help us copy you. 
Help us be imitators of you. Treat people with respect and dignity and love and kindness. To remember all the things you've done for us and how many times in a day sometimes you have to forgive us. Help us to be that forgiving, that loving, that kind. We pray it in Jesus' wonderful name. And somebody say, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. God bless you. Will you give the Lord a hand of praise before you leave today? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday night at 730 and next Sunday morning at 1030.